We think about our families at a time like this. Think about mom. Got a brand new grandson in the Cluck tribe. Yes. And uh, we, we, have our, we have something we'd like to show you. Go ahead. So, for those of you who don't know, that's our son and his wife, and we're actually going to be grandparents for the first time. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, really cool. And the hard thing is, we've been keeping this secret for two months, not being able to tell anybody. So, when I was away last week at District Council, I got the word that it was okay to share it. So, uh, we're going to join the ranks of so many of you. Uh, and hopefully it won't stop with one, but we don't want to push them, you know. So <laughs> I told Jordan, I said, you know, my birthday's on November 12th. And she said, well, we got a decent chance of it being at least close to that date, so. There'll be no spoilings there. No, no spoiling at all. So pretty exciting. I still remember my dad, who was 62, when uh, he became a grandparent for the first time, and he used to always drop his little hints. And he used to say, I'm going to be the oldest living grandfather in captivity. But uh, I beat him by a couple years anyway. So the people have always been quick to see the resemblance between my sister and I. And I got a picture here from about 40, 45 years ago. You go ahead, put that up. So you can see the similarity, especially when we were young. I had lots of dark hair. I'm the one on the right in case you weren't sure. And uh, when I, she's older than me, and when I followed her in school, people would always say, Beitzel, you gotta be Lori's brother. You have to be. <laughs> and uh, she got better grades than I did, so I was always that expectation that I was gonna rise to, to that same occasion. And uh, I think at that time, we both looked a lot like our, our mother. It's a picture of my mom and her mom right about that same time. And uh, so we've always kind of featured uh, a lot of our mom. And as I get older, I look in the mirror, I see dad coming back. And uh, there's a picture of dad with Sarah when she was little. I think it's the white hair. Uh, I'm not sure. But uh, <laughs> the family of God, though, is a lot like this. We resemble one another. Not so much physically, but in our, our nature, in the things that make us happy in the things that get us excited, right? Yeah. And, and sometimes in the things that we pray against, right? There's a united front as children of God. You don't have to be around a fellow believer very long until you recognize that you both look a lot like your father. It's good to spend time with the family of God. It's my favorite day of the week. It's my favorite time of the week, Sunday morning. Uh, I love every day of the week. I love coming into the office every day. I love everything about what God has me doing here. And I love that when you get engaged and we work together. Uh, had a craft fair yesterday with the parking lot full of vendors. And a special thanks to the folks who were, were here to make sure that went off without a hitch. Even the last minute food truck replacement, right? So <laughs> all those things you don't plan on all the time. And speaking of family, I, I do want to let you know, and some of you may already be aware that uh, Betty Burkholder passed away this past week, and uh, she had been in hospice care for quite a while. She was 89 years old. A lot of you don't know who Betty Burkholder is, but she used to, she used to go here, and uh, the services are Wednesday at uh, Vogelsanger Bricker Funeral Home, 1 o'clock, viewing 2 o'clock service if you'd like to come and uh, pay your respects. I'm sure the families would appreciate that. So this whole idea of, of looking like your family, let's make a little mental book note of that. We're going to come back to that several times during this uh, message this morning. We're in a series, and the theme of it is, how do you know who to believe? A lot of people seem to be confused. You hear uh, one preacher preaches this, another preacher preaches that. Some people uh, question, I don't, I'm not quite sure if I believe that, or are they a false teacher? And we live in a very critical society, so a lot of times the critics come out and anything they don't understand, they label as false teaching. And 
that's not right. Regardless of what you may believe, not everybody is out to get you. However, we do need to be on guard. And the best way that we can be on guard is to educate ourselves, not with the fake, but with the real. If you want to know about God, you read his word. If you want to know about Jesus, you follow him. You do what he's telling you to do. You spend time in prayer. You commit your life to it. What if it was illegal to be a Christian? You remember during the shutdown? Everybody was raising Cain and marching in the streets saying, we deserve the right to go to church. And half of them were people that never went before. I wonder sometimes if revival is not contingent upon hardship. It doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to wait to get excited for Jesus until there's pressure not to get excited for Jesus. God help us if we're coasting. So we need to know the genuine. We need to avoid being critical. We need to stay close to Jesus. We've been in 1 John. It's been our text for this series, and today is no exception. We're going to be looking at 1 John chapter 3. Just as a little refresher, uh, at this time in history when the Apostle John wrote this letter, it was nearing the end of his life, probably in the mid-80s, maybe even as late as 90 A.D., And John wanted to go on record with a few things. He wrote the Gospel of John, the letters of John, and also the book of Revelation right around the same time. Just thinking, here I am, the last of the apostles. And he was the only one indeed that lived his whole life through, died a natural death. But I'm sure that when he saw the false teachers creeping in, he wanted to make sure that his children in the faith did not get led astray. They didn't have the completed New Testament like we do today. They're writing the New Testament, right? So he goes on record so that people understand that when the false teachers come, that they can recognize the false because they're so immersed in the true. And there was a group of people that had pulled out of the church at this time who claimed secret knowledge. They claimed to know more than those who walked with Jesus. And here's John saying, Uh, wait a minute, I look over here, I know more than you do because I spent all of my time with this guy. I was the only one that was at the foot of the cross. I saw his resurrection. I ran first to the tomb on that first Easter morning. And he's putting this down. We have uh, extra biblical accounts of the early church fathers that attest to the fact that John the Apostle indeed wrote these letters. So we have an incredible privilege of having this uh, maintained for us and preserved for us. So that's why we're looking at 1 John when it comes to the idea of who can you believe. The first week I reminded you that not everyone is out to get you. There are those who are for us. And we need to, to walk arm in arm with those who are for us. Some of them have a different label over their church than ours, right? But when they're following Jesus and they're They're staying close to his word that we need to walk arm in arm with those people. I talked about there being a dichotomy. Uh, It seems like there's two different organizations calling themselves the church. There's one organization that is denying biblical truths. There, unfortunately, was one just the other week that just put more nails in its coffin, denying what the Bible says about a lot of things, including human sexuality. That's just part of it. There are those who seem to be preaching a different Jesus. And I feel bad for the true believers that feel trapped in those organizations. I, I, don't, I don't call out names, but if someone denies who Jesus is and denies the Word of God on some basic issues, I'm going to stand against it. Amen. Not against the people, but I'm going to stand against these things. There are things to look out for, and there seems like there's a dichotomy because those churches, by and large, are dwindling and closing while the church that Jesus died for that is out to win souls and make disciples is growing. We see it happening all around the world and it's exciting and that's why I showed you that video this morning. Lest you get upset at watching the news because the news is only going to give you bad news. There was a local newscast that did the right thing and talked about a, 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 a revival amongst college-age kids, in a time 
in place where you see nothing but revolt on our college campuses. Don't let that, don't let the turkeys get you down. Understand that God is still moving by His Spirit. Amen. Second week we talked that, said that God is light in Him there is no darkness at all. And, and I ask you two questions. Are you walking in the light? Will your life stand the test of bright light? If your, light, if your life will not stand the test of bright light, then consecrate yourself to Jesus and, and do what it is that, the, that will survive illumination by the bright light. Right? In our political climate, I've often said, just let God's light of truth shine on everything. We need to see the truth. And the other question is, are, are you continuing to walk in the light, right? Does, do, do teachings, the other teachings you hear, do they stand uh, the criticism of bright light? It's a way for us to recognize the false uh, from the true. And last week talked about authentic versus counterfeit uh, in 1 John 2, focused on identifying some necessary traits in our lives that show authenticity. And we can try to fake it until you make it, but it's, uh, it's not the same as being authentic and being genuine. We need to be authentic believers and followers of Jesus Christ. Keep His commands. Love your fellow believers. Not be so much in love with the world that we miss what it is that He wants to do in and through us. And believe that Jesus is who He says He is. So if you know the authentic, you're going to recognize the counterfeit, right? Right. This week, I want to consider what the Word has to say about family resemblance. Uh, has been the case so far in this series. The takeaway is really what the real thing looks like. The, the character traits of one who's a genuine child of God. If you're part of the family of God, you don't look like the world. God's kids and the devil's kids look different. And a lot of times, neither can understand the other. And that's just the way it is. And there should be a distinction between us and the world. Kind of say, if there's family resemblance, we know who their father is. So, those are the main takeaways. I hope you stay, but if you have to leave, that's the main takeaway for today. You can write that down and at least feel like you haven't missed anything, but I hope you'll stay. Uh, through the Word of God and through the indwelling Holy Spirit, we can know what and how we can look like our Heavenly Father, uh, His work, our cooperation. We can say, if God wants me to experience more of Him, then He'll reveal it to me. No, it takes our cooperation. That'd be like saying, if God wants to save me from hell, He can go ahead and do it. No, He's already made a way. But it takes our cooperation. If God wants me to fill me with His Holy Spirit, evidence and speaking in tongues and the gifts of the Spirit, well, well, then He can do it. But usually that attitude says, I'm not going to give Him a chance. But if we cooperate with Him and we find ourselves uh, going into the more of our experience with the Lord, see, it's cooperation. We've got to cooperate. We can't look at this as a list of what to be for and what to be against. Because here, what happens is, at some point, it's inevitable that you have to add more to either list. You can't keep up. Every day we've got to add a list of what to be for and what to be against. So it can't just be these lists of what to do and what not to do, because that doesn't get to the heart. We've got to know Jesus. We've got to have a relationship with Him. We've got to be pursuing Him with everything that we have. And then we won't be reliant upon these lists. We'll know in our heart what is right and what is false. Much better equipped to tell the true from the false if you yourself are living in the truth. There's no better way to do that than to look into the Word of God. We're going to do that this morning. 1 John chapter 3. Just looking at verses 1 through 3. There's an awful lot in this passage of Scripture and uh, today I'm using the New King James Version. You never know what version it's going to be. There's something about the way it flows in, in the New King James. Uh, it's, uh, you know, a lot of people like the King James because of its poetic beauty. And sometimes I trip over the words. So 
I like the New King James in this case because it leaves the beauty of the language and so much that we can pull out of it. Uh, but you know me, we'll be a different translation next week. But here's, here's, here's what it says. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Therefore the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as He is pure. Boy, there's a lot of rich stuff in here. Let me try to explain this with an analogy. Let's say you're walking down the street and you happen upon a homeless person. And, and they're sitting there, they, have, they really have nothing, they're begging, uh, they're, they're, they're filthy dirty, they probably don't smell too good as you walk by. If you were to be merciful upon them, you might give them some money, you might give them some food, you might arrange for a place for them to get a shower. You might get them a hotel or something for a night or two and find them a place to stay. In a more rare case, you might find them a job. Uh, you might find permanent housing. In an even more rare case, you might buy them a house or buy them a car. Behold, what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called children of God. Here's what God does. Take the man home to your house permanently and adopt him. Give him your name. Put him in your will. <laughs> Treat him as your very own son. And more than that, give your own son for his life. So when we talk about beholding what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that's the manner of love that he has bestowed upon us. Now, there may be someone in this room that would do all those things, but it's doubtful. And I'm not saying that we should. I'm just saying that God loved the world so much that that's exactly what he did. If you are in Christ, if you are born again, you have been adopted into the royal family of God. Yes. And he looks on you just like you never sinned. He looks on you that he says, I, I can't wait to bless you. I can't wait to give you the riches of heaven. I can't wait to just shower my love upon you. And John writes here, who wrote more about the love of God than any of the other gospel writers and now writing in, in the epistles that bear his name. Behold what kind of love that God has for us. And because we're all adopted into that family if we're born again, the family of God is like no other family ever. That God is that interested in you. That God loves you that much that He is absolutely crazy about you. And let's not forget the reason why we get to call ourselves children of God. That great love of God was His choice, His plan. He initiated it. We did nothing but receive it. You cannot work yourself into favor before God. There's no list of sins that you don't do and no list of attributes that you can claim that can earn even remotely close to the favor that God shows upon His children. We simply cooperate and say, yes, thank you. Thank you for forgiveness of sin. Thank you for that transformed life. And he takes what is old and stinky and smelly and homeless 
and turns us into brand new creations. And he never stops. He never stops. You don't get to be called a child of God because you're a good boy or a good girl. You don't simply get to identify as a child of God because you choose to. And we live in this dysfunctional society that is claiming all kinds of stuff. You know, they get on Christians of a certain ilk for naming and claiming. Well, the world's doing that now. It's a copy. I'm not saying I believe in name it and claim it theology. However, we've got a whole lot more at our at access than we any of us think we do. But the world is now copying that and turning it the other way. Aren't they? Aren't they naming and claiming? I want no credentials, but I claim that I am this or I am that. And and I, I don't hate anybody. I, I feel love for them and my heart breaks for them. They're looking for purpose. They're looking for identity. They're looking for something more to this crazy mixed up world. But they're, they're looking to the wrong family. We don't get to be called a child of God simply because we're created by God. Because everybody is created by God. But regardless of what some will tell you, we're not all children of God. You're a child of God when you're born again. When you've been changed, that gives you the right to say, I am a child of God. Every single person is created by God, but only believers in Christ can be called the children of God. His great love, I love this, behold what manner of love. (laughs) That included Jesus. That included Jesus, the only one who had the characteristics and the qualities to be able to take your place, to be able to take my place. The only man who ever walked 100% flesh, but yet was 100% God. The only man that ever walked the earth without sin, but yet he paid sin's penalty. That's why he's the only way. It's not a matter of uh, intellectual enlightenment. Intellectual enlightenment is great, and we should learn, and we should discover, and that's wonderful but it can't take the place of the grace of God. No wonder 1 Peter 2.9 calls God's children peculiar people. How many are you ready to own that? Peculiar? Any weird people here? We're really, really tired this morning. How many weird people here? How many peculiar people in the house? Yeah, and that's why, that's why it's so hard for, for people who aren't following Jesus to understand the things that we do and to understand our priorities. You know, I mean, Melody and I talk all the time, like, how in the world do people afford these cars? I mean, they're, they're like they get seven-year loans on a $120,000 car. Yeah. You know? I say, well, if you don't tithe, you know, maybe you can do it. But we, we invest our time, we invest our resources in, in things that the world doesn't understand. And we don't understand why people who aren't following Jesus, not that I'm not knocking anyone has a nice car, I'm just saying, sometimes priorities are mixed up, right, depending on which family you're looking at. I don't think we have to take a vow of poverty, but what you do with your money, your time, your effort, uh, it, it all shows in priorities. We're unique. We stand out from the rest of the world, and we should. We should. Leads right into the last part of verse 1. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. And here it means the world. It means the world's system. Not everybody in the world, and not all the systems in the world, but the world's system, the part of it that is against God. The part that is anti-Christ. That's that world system does not know us because it did not know him. It's like they say, who's your daddy? And you can tell who your daddy is by who you look like. And if you look like the world and you're unchanged, then we can't claim to be children of God. If you look like Jesus, well, then we don't look like the world system. John comes right out and says this in verse 10 of this chapter. Uh, In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Two families, children of God and children of the devil. 
And I don't say that in a negative way. We need to have love for people. We want them to become disciples of Christ. We want to give them hope. Right? Children of God are going to do what's right, and the children of the devil do not. In John 8, uh, John said to those who claimed to believe in him, but they challenged him by their questions, he told them, you are of your father, the devil. Woo! There's a lot of churches today that don't like to read those verses. Makes for a stark contrast at family reunions. My dad was one of ten kids. There's only one of them left. One thing I remember about our family reunions was people sitting around going, Huh? What? I didn't hear you. And, and I'm getting some of that resemblance. Uh, it's in my genes, you know. But the, the world doesn't get us. Can anyone not see this? Faith is not logical to the world. Because they don't understand faith. How can you put your hope in something that you can't see or touch? And yet, what we can't see or touch, it's the evidence. Faith is the evidence, right, of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. And, and when you're transformed and you're following Jesus, you get this. Things don't always have to make sense. There are some things that are not going to make sense until you trust God and take Him at His word, and then He comes around and, and verifies it and proves it. Do you know what I'm talking about? So many things, we just, it does not make sense, but God, but God. Holiness isn't natural. The natural thing to do is to just, the flesh wants what the flesh wants, so give the flesh what it wants at all times. And, and we're validated in our society today. Well, good for you. Good for you. You stood up for what you want. And that's why it makes it difficult for us sometimes. And, and there is a line, there is a distinction, there is a difference in the family of God and the family of the world's system. And sometimes I think we try to fight that, and we, we get all worried about what people think of us, and we get all concerned, well, they're going to think I'm high and mighty. They're going to think that anyway. But when can we just, just be who God made us to be? People are looking for something different. They're looking for something that works. They're looking for something that isn't like the system they're mired in now. Man, we just gotta, we gotta shine. We gotta show them who our Father is. At best, the world understands religion. At best. And religion is not a relationship with God. There are elements of religion that are helpful. We, we meet together on Sunday mornings. We do it at 10 o'clock. There are certain things we do. We sing and we worship. And there's a, there's, a, there's a format there. There's a form. And it works until you start worshiping the form. Yes. Yeah. There are bumpers and guardrails that we place in our lives. Not a good idea to go to the casino. Why? Because a lot of people lose money and their families suffer. It's a good idea not to drink alcohol. Why? Because too many people have made excess of it, and it ruins your life. We have bumpers and guardrails, maybe about dressing modestly or, or different things like that. But when we worship the bumpers and guardrails, we're, we're in bondage. You got it? Yeah. And there's freedom beyond that. The world understands religion. The world understands going to church. The world understands not going to casinos or not drinking and all this kind of stuff that we use as bumpers and guardrails. But they don't understand transformation. And that's why they don't get us. Get used to it. Get over it. They're not going to get us. However, they will respect us if we are consistent in how we live our lives. There should be a little bit of mystery how is it these people are able to do this and they do, devote their time to the Lord's work and they give to missionaries and they tithe 10% of their income? And how do they do it? And I say, how, how can you not? Right? There should be some mystery. Uh, 
Mike Pence, when he was running, when they were running the first time, he made a comment that God speaks to me. And not to even dignify her with a name, but a lady on a, on a morning talk show claimed that, that he had a mental illness it's because God speaks to them. And the last thing we want to do is argue with that. That's why people get all bent out of shape on social media, because they take that on. You can't. It's two different families. There's no understanding. It's, it's like two pigs rolling around in the mud. You just get dirty. <laughs> Verse 2 of our passage today, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. I have some emphasis on some of these words because it speaks of a time, timeline. The first thing it says is now we are children of God. If you're born again, you're a child of God. Amen. You don't have to wait to become a child of God. You're a child of God now. Yeah. Right in the middle of the world in which we live, right in the middle of all the stuff we see going on around the world that kind of makes us sick to our stomach. No, we're not waiting for it. It's instantaneous. There is a born-again experience when you decide to follow Jesus and turn from the world. That's the experience, and that is now. Now we are children of God. And then there's some future stuff. It's not been revealed what we shall be. When Jesus is revealed, that means when we see him face to face, it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. It's like thinking about Jesus in his glorified, resurrected body, right? We talk about that a lot. He was able to eat. He bore scars, but yet he could appear and, and disappear. He looked different. There's something about that that is a hint toward what we shall be, but it's more than just our appearance and a, and a glorified body. It's the fact that we will be like him because all of the things of this world that are keeping us from being more like him will no longer be there. There's a battle going on. There's a struggle going on. There, there are things that sometimes we cave into because we're surrounded by it. You know, and God loves us just the same. He says, get up, dust yourself off, let's go at it again. There's grace when we make mistakes. But it's not yet been revealed what we shall be because when he is revealed, we shall be like him. Can that just blow your mind? Yeah. Right? So we talked about the the. the Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us. And we use the illustration of the, the homeless guy and all of that and saying that, they, that you know, God takes us in our awful condition, in our stinky, smelly condition, and, and treats us just like sons and daughters. And, and it gets, gets better because someday we will be like him. Yes. Wow. different stages of growth as we mature in Christ. But our status as a child of God is not dependent upon our maturity. Sanctification is instant and lifelong. It means we're set apart when we're born again, but we don't automatically drop all the stuff that the world had hung on us, right? We grow, and we're different stages of growth, and we continue to grow and mature. The, the church in Corinth, when Paul wrote the letters, they're a good example of immaturity, but yet they were used in all of the gifts of the Holy Spirit. But they were still immature because they didn't understand holiness and not looking like the world. And Paul wrote to them, I'm sure exasperated. He probably pulled his hair out, right? Right, and said, come on, kids. What are you doing? Stop doing this. But yet, that didn't stop God from investing his Holy Spirit in them, right? We mature as we go. We cannot say, oh, I'm still immature, or this stuff is hanging on me, I'm trying to shake this, I'm trying to quit that, I'm trying to pick up this, and, and we worry about our salvation. No, it's not our salvation that's at issue. It's instantaneous when we're born again. But as we allow him to do the work and chisel all that stuff off of us, then we become more and more like the person that he has designed us to be. If you're born again, you're redeemed, you're a child of God. It's not earned. 
no amount of good works you could ever do. So if you're coming to church every week trying to earn favor before God, you're missing the point. If you're not doing certain things in order to earn God's favor, you're missing the point. If you're letting him change your heart so that you become someone who wants to live for him, then you're getting the point. And we're all in process, are we not? I love it. What we shall be, it's future, it's not yet been revealed. What we will be like when we see Jesus. Paul wrote in 1 Thessalonians 4, that when we meet the Lord in the air, right? And he says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Then things are going to click. Then it's all going to make sense. Then the, the world system and flesh and, and all of that is, is going to drop off and we're going to understand more completely. Until then, we have faith that that day is coming. We have faith that when we see him face to face, we will be like him when he is revealed. We can't understand yet what our glorified bodies are going to look like, but I love what Paul writes in Philippians 3, 20 and 21. For our citizenship is in heaven, from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he's able even to subdue all things to himself. Hallelujah. No wonder that day is depicted as a glad reunion day in so many of our songs. Going to be a happy meeting someday on that glad reunion day. Wow. The greatest family reunion ever. <laughs> because the fellowship of God's family on earth, as great as it is, is nothing compared to what's to come. You ain't seen nothing yet. Amen. Hallelujah. And when we come through this life and, and we experience victories in this life, and that is how we should live. We should always be living for the more. We're not earning salvation. We're not earning anything. We're simply experiencing what God has laid out for us. But even when that is exhausted and our bodies give out and we go to see him, wow, we're just getting started. Yes. Hallelujah. Sometimes I think we avoid talking about heaven because it's, uh, you know, so pie in the sky, you know, when I die, I need something for today. And, and that's true. But we can also err to not talk about heaven, to not talk about that, that eternal home of the soul when we have new bodies that are not subject to the decay and, and the temptation and death and sickness and all of those things, we do well to remind ourselves of the eventuality that's at the other end of this mortal existence. And that is an eternity in perfection, absolute perfection, beyond anything any of us have ever dreamt possible. Gives us hope, right? It gives us hope. You have that hope. You have the, the hope of Christ coming, the hope of seeing Jesus. Well, this passage here in verse 3 says, everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself, just as he, capital H, meaning Jesus, is pure. It's an admonition to us to set our sights on living lives of holiness, to avoid the entrapments of the world. Holiness is not a dirty word. I know that some people have redefined it to mean certain specific behaviors and clothing and all these kind of things. Uh, modesty in clothing is a good idea. Uh, bumpers and guardrails keep us uh, not to be stained from the world. But my goodness, let's, let's let God purify us. Huh? We want a, a purity that comes from the work of the Holy Spirit, not from the work of man-made systems. If that hope is in you, you will live it out, tangibly, obviously. If we are holy and we, and we decide to make ourselves holy and purify ourselves, let's face it, if you're born again, you are instantly clean, but sometimes before you can even walk two steps, we're dirty again. We're, we're stained, you know. Our, I heard someone say that our spirits are perfect, but our body and our soul is still playing catch-up, you know. So it's an ongoing relationship with the Lord. And, and let's not make it about what we can or can't do and still go to heaven. Just get over that. Yeah. You're born again, you're headed for heaven, unless you reject Christ. But let's make it about 
What does God want for me? Amen. How can I shine more brightly? Amen. Are there things that are in my life that are affecting my witness to the world? Are, are there things that I am living in fear about, like deeper things of God, like, like praising Him with your lips and expressing the joy that's inside and go ahead and... Are there things that we live in fear of that, that fear did not come from God? It comes from the enemy of our soul who does not want us to witness to people around us. The family of God, the family of the world, the resemblance, there should be separate, there should be a difference in what we do. And if we live like the world and we claim to follow Jesus, our testimony is devoid of any authority. Jesus said in John 15, 18, if the world hates you, remember, it hated me first. <laughs> Get over it. The more vocal you are about Jesus, the more people are going to say things against you. Get over it. So what? And as we're in this process of looking more like Jesus, we're going to fall short. We're going to mess up. But we're going to repent. We're going to have victory. We're going to get back on the horse. We're going to live to tell a testimony of how God brought us from here to here. Amen. And you're going to be able to come over here and say, I remember back there when it was such a struggle for me to say the name Jesus in public. Yeah. And you're going to look at that and you're going to go, wow, look where he's brought me to. Yeah. Yes. And then down the road, you're going to look back on that time. And you're going to see that he makes you. We can't make ourselves. It's a work of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. To get to that point where our greatest heart motivation is to be pure just as God is pure, to, to, to witness for him by what we say and what we do. Not forced, but supernaturally, as God continues that work in us. So how do you know who to believe when it comes to family resemblance? Well, i got three that I'd like to share with you this morning. The first one is motives of the heart. Motives of the heart. If you live like hell, and say, I love God, there's a problem. Mm -hmm. And if that's you, it means let's go back to the beginning and make sure you surrender your life to Jesus. But from the outside in, if we're trying to discern the true from the false, this is one way that we can tell. If, if there's too much world and all talk, something's wrong. You might not want to take the authority of what they teach you. We don't distance ourselves from people. We are in this world, not of it. We are to be salt and light in this world. We don't get to hide out. Right. However, we need to use some discernment into who, as to uh, who to believe. So look at motives of the heart. We can't judge those motives. We can only look and be fruit inspectors of what comes on the outside. If you live one way, talk another, there's a problem. The other thing is uh, being grateful to God. If there's an attitude of gratitude toward God, toward what He's done for us, that should show in our lives. We should be grateful people. We should not be complainers. Don't get drugged down into the world system. The people that gripe about the weather, you know who they're, what they're doing? They're, they're criticizing God. Aren't they? I mean, really. Aren't they criticizing God? We get so critical about everything. You want to blame everybody, especially those who are like your superiors, like government and whatnot. Critical, critical, critical. If there's not an attitude that is grateful for who God is and for what he's done, I would question what comes out of their mouth. And if we do not have an attitude of being grateful for what God has done for us, Maybe it's time for us to get back to the beginning and say, Lord, change my heart. And the third one is a desire to be like Jesus. 
if our goal is to emulate Jesus in every way. And, and some people think that means you don't get angry. No, Jesus got angry. He got angry at things that were against God. He did so without sinning. It is possible to be angry without sinning. There are things going on in this world that we should be angry about because it, it injures us. And uh, we're not judging things that God has already made a judgment on. If we claim to know the desire of somebody's heart, well, then we're guilty of judging. But there are standards and there are biblical, there's a biblical mindset. If you have a biblical world view, well, then we should be desiring to live like Jesus. And that's what we see in others as well. If someone is teaching, the Bible says not many should seek to teach because there's a higher accountability. I think about that every time I stand up in front of people. So if someone is teaching and claims to have the superior knowledge, but their life is not looking like Jesus, then I would question what they are saying. If you don't want to be taken advantage of by the world, which has no understanding about those weird people that are called children of God, well then stop doing what they do. Spend more time with God's kids. God knew you couldn't do this on your own, so he established the church. The ecclesia, the called out assembly, that we have been called out of a world system that is anti-Christ, and we come together as the body of Christ. We're not the only church in town. There are plenty of churches that gather together today, and even in different traditions. That's not the important thing. The important thing is honoring Jesus, coming together under his utmost authority. We need one another. We need the church. He sent the Holy Spirit. When we were born again, we cannot be saved without the, the uh, regeneration of the Holy Spirit. It indwells all believers. Everybody has the Holy Spirit who is born again. But there's a second work that we refer to as the baptism in the Holy Spirit when we really get serious and we come hungry and we say, God, I believe that you're going to do in me. And, and he is all too happy to let us have that and to give us, and we find ourselves being more equipped. We find ourselves saying, you know what? I can do what he's calling me to do. And, and we find ourselves saying things we never thought we'd say. We find ourselves doing things we never thought we'd do. We find they seem like talents that we didn't learn. Uh, what is this going on? It's when we give full control through the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. This is what he wants, you know? I've said it before, and I'll say it again. Well, if God wants me to have the baptism in the Holy Spirit and, you know, be able to speak and pray in tongues and be able to do, operate in all these gifts, if he wants that, he'll give it to me. Well, go home today and tell the Lord, if you want me to eat lunch, you'll make it force down my throat. <laughs> There's cooperation in this, folks. And if you want to see what's on the other side of where you're at right now, get a desire and get a hunger yes. for everything that he has for you. Don't stagnate. Don't stay still. We're not earning anything. We're experiencing more of God. Doesn't make you immune to temptation. Doesn't mean you're never going to sin. What it does is it gives you a bit of, bit of, a, bit of a, a better switch <laughs> that you recognize, hey, going the wrong way. Taking advantage of what God has given. There's a family resemblance among the children of God and God's incredible love is what has made it possible. Who do you look like today? As I get older, I say I look more like Dad. I see my cousins, and we tell stories. I have one cousin uh, that says, oh, man, I'm, I'm about the age Dad was when he died. I'm getting worried. Or you might say, you know what? My dad used to always tell me this, and I used to go, yeah, blah, 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 and now I'm saying the same thing. <laughs> and uh, we're, you, the hairlines and the color of the hair and, the, you know, that... You know, you start seeing some similarities as you, as you grow older. But you know what? We should see similarities in the one who redeemed us. Yes. As we grow in him, as we become less like the world and more like Jesus. We live in two worlds. We have to stand guard 
over our heart. Your family, both uh, physically and spiritually, we need to spend time with them. We need to learn from one another. I'm going to tell you something that, that hit me uh, this past week as we were out in Erie. Jim John Sauser and I went to district council out in Erie, and it was a great experience and saw a lot of people that I don't usually see more than once a year. And uh, I would, I'd, I'd say that the, I think the worship at the events was, was off the charts. I think there was a real hunger in the room. Um, I heard testimonies of other people saying, we're seeing a move of God in our church. We're seeing growth. When so many churches in our country are saying the exact opposite, we're shrinking, we're dying. And it was good to get around people of the same tribe, you know, and kind of celebrate what God is doing. But there's been something for the past couple of weeks, and a number of things have happened uh, that can only be God. But I was standing in time of worship uh, on the last day we were there, which was Wednesday. And I was reminded of the struggle that I sensed from time to time. I shared it with the friend, pastor friend out there. There are times when it's almost like I'm being held back from something. Um, and it could be God saying, not yet, but there's this, and I'm sensing it more and more, and I, and I identified something that I believe is part of that. And you have not heard me giving evil spirits names too often around here because I think we can get really hung up on this stuff, you know? Who, who are we to name? What We know that the, there's a, a system in the world that's against us as believers. But uh, the word came right into my head, and it's bondage. It's bondage. And it shows itself in the world very easily, because what a lot of people see as freedom is really bondage, Right? free to do this, and then there's always a price to pay. But I'm telling you something, in the church of Jesus Christ, there's the same kind of thing that happens. And it might be the biggest opposition, spiritually speaking, in our region. I believe there are territorial spirits. I believe there are strongholds. Um, I, I, I kind of used to say when I was out in Indiana, it was such a Catholic area that even the people who weren't Catholic were Catholic in some of the way they looked at things, right? It's only natural. Yeah. And, and honestly, and I'm not picking on anybody, I, I had good Catholic friends out there, but here it's a, it's a very Mennonite culture, and there's nothing wrong with Mennonites, not at all. But it, there, there's, a, there's a side issue of that, and I had some of this growing up too, that it's kind of rules, it's rules and regulations first. And, and I, I'm not... I very hesitate to even make that sound negative because there's a lot of wonderful, holy people. But if it's left unchecked, it can become a system of bondage. It can become, don't experience more of God. And so there are certain strongholds in different areas. And I'd like to ask you to do something. And, and there's something else. There can be a bondage of expectation among people of God. And I'll explain that. For me to say to you something that I have a very strong conviction about, you should share that. Or something that I spend a lot of time studying, you should share that. And that's unfair. That's unfair. I mean, if we're all seeking Jesus and we're staying in his word, that's the most important thing. But there can be some manipulation from children of God that kind of get on a, they get on a one track and they start making that the most important thing. We have to stand against that too. And we have to look at ourselves, first of all. Is there anything about what we're doing as we are reaching out that is manipulative, or are we simply pointing people to Jesus? The enemy is going to push back whenever there's kingdom advance. And we have the authority and the responsibility to push back. 
We don't do it in our own strength. We don't do it in our flesh. But we do it on our knees.